Now really happy to um, introduce um, Henrik Holm. Um, when we put together the first um, seminar uh, last November, um, our MFA colleague Mary Cobble had identified the situation that was occurring with the Royal Danish uh, Cast um, Collection, which was under some sort of political sort of condition of sort of threat and sort of closure, but also um, through a sort of a desire to sort of disavow its particular sort of histories, um, etc. And in that sort of moment, we invited Henrik to address us in November, and it just wasn't a good time for him at that moment to be able to do it. So when we knew that we were having a follow-up um, seminar, um, now we invited him again, and this time he's very kindly been able to um, accept the offer to be here and to discuss that, that case of what is happening within the museum in which he has been employed and the ways in which he has strategized and used um, interventions himself from a curatorial and keeper perspective of um, a collection amidst a moment of uh, political problematics. So, can I call? Thank you. Uh, first, I would like you all to change your positions. Switch places. You need a little moving around, okay? I will start when everybody has changed position. Just a little, right? You guys are really tough guys, but you can really stay for so long listening. Um, yeah, the first time I was invited, I had to die a little because I was sacked from the museum and my, uh, the work that I will present to you uh, suddenly became all in the past time sense. Uh, so uh, I couldn't really manage uh, to stand up at that moment, uh, but here I am um, trying to live with it. Um, I have been... Um, trying to supplement an old museum, uh, a cast collection, with contemporary art. Uh, and I have used different criteria uh, to do my selection. And uh, one of the criteria is that uh, I have to think of the intervention as a kind of participatory uh, project that has to involve me and others. Uh, but the key thing is that uh, even though I accept or do not accept uh, who will be invited in, uh, it's not my idea, and I'm not totally in charge of what goes on, and I'm certainly not quite aware of where it will all end. That's one thing that uh, can really panic off curators, to have a thing going on that you do not know the ends of. They hate that. They write catalogs to avoid those things, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and they really hate it. Uh, but I kind of, of, uh, of like it to be kind of surprised by people coming to me saying, couldn't we do this or that? And I will say, well, let's give it a try. See what happens, right? That was the attitude. Um, so the ideas that I will present to you was not mine. That's one criteria. Um, the outcome has to be unpredictable, at least to me. Um, <clears throat> and the topic that is addressed through the intervention has to, be, has to be a hot topic. It has to be something that I can see, oh, this is this is clashing with something. I, there has to be some kind of pain to it. Uh, that, is, that is in order to uh, avoid this kind of aestheticization of everything that goes on in a museum turns nice in a second, because museums are all nice. So no matter what you put in them, it all turns nice. <laughs> and this place that I'm in charge of is not nice. It doesn't have a nice history. It's uh, a dusty place, and there are uh, um, uh, different uh, conditions that make it possible for me to say that I don't want nice. <clears throat> and also, one final thing, if an intervention is done into a museum without leaving any trace or any change to the museum itself, it's a complete waste of time and money. So the Tate, uh, uh, the Tate project is, of course, very, very, a very nice example of a good a good intervention. Um, I don't know if I can, I, I might be able to, to say a little about the, the, um, the outcome of my work here uh, and the impact on other museums too. Um, 
first. This is the National Gallery in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. And the Cass Collection is now in another house. It's a satellite museum at the harbor front. Uh, but it wasn't in the first place. Uh, when this museum opened in 1896, the Cass Collection was taking up the entire ground floor. And look at that facade here. These grand windows are completely the worst, they are the worst thing you could imagine if you want to display painting. But uh, they are, and they are turning southwards, really, the baddest thing. But to a cast collection, this is the best thing you could ever want. So the, the house is shaped to have a cast collection, which is odd, because, um, well, to us it might be. But in those days, it was pretty normal for a museum or a university to have a cast collection. It was considered a study object. Uh, the academies had them. Uh, but this time, it was considered not a study collection, not for specialists. It was considered a necessary supplement to the ordinary collection. And it was uh, said that it had to educate the citizen so that the citizen could train himself to become a good citizen, a citizen that knows European art that knows what good taste is, that knows about progress, and all the fine things that Western civilization has brought with it. With, with it. Uh, that was the big story that had to be told. And since they couldn't get the originals, it was all right to take in the supplementary uh, um, objects of a cast collection. So it was not really a supplement then. It was the basic thing that you had to walk through. And if you walk through a cast collection, you perform Western thinking and Western ideals. And this is the founder of the cast collection. He had, of course, some tough ideas about why we should have a thing like that. And he said that non-European civilizations, such as the Japanese, they worship nature. They're primitive, right? But Europe is Europe because we worship man, its intervention, and its favorite. <coughs> That was a thing you could say in those days without any trouble. Everybody would agree. It would be a nice thing to say. And it, because he said it, he got his cast collection. It's not that easy to say that kind of sentence today. But it laid the ground for the organization of the collection. It was chronologically uh, displaced uh, uh, and uh, shown. And what it is, it shows the development of human sculpture or the human form, art history, basically, from the more primitive to the more elaborate. Uh, and the, the end of that history is the Renaissance. That's the peak of that development. Then comes Baroque, which is a bit of a problem, because that's not good taste, so they left it out. <laughs> the uh, history, art history, uh, actually stops at the end of the Renaissance in this collection. So it has its limits. Middle Ages, thousand years of history, also a bit of a problem. So they didn't buy that much of it. We had to buy extra things from the Middle Ages later on. Um, now, you had to go through this collection, and then you would perform Western self-understanding. Uh, by walking through. And um, this kind of, this, this idea of adding performativity theory into this collection has been very rewarding to me. Uh, I want to, to show you a quote from, from uh, Judith Butler. She says, and she knows, of course, nothing about uh, cast collections. Nobody really does. Uh, but she says that gender is instituted by stylized repetitions of acts and stylization of the body. And that is what a cast collection is made of. of. It's all bodies performing the ideal of man and, and woman. And uh, it's repetition after repetition after. It's 2,500 pieces repeating the same story about man and woman in this collection. It is one of the largest remaining old collections in the world. Um, and uh, so 
it's a good place for taking up gender trouble issues, right? So of course we did that as one of our interventions. Just writing through a guided tour of the collection using Judy Butler was, was so tricky that I had to have um, students from Yale University doing it for me. Not that I couldn't do it, but it was kind of okay if it was only a student that did it. You understand, right? She's just doing something that relates to study. It's not, the curator is not really doing uh, a monograph or something. No, no, it was just a little paper. So that, uh, that was okay. Um, now, cast collections are really um, something to hate um, for many reasons. Uh, many of them has been discharged of, many of them has been destroyed uh, because of war. Um, and of course the avant-garde uh, movements uh, through, the, uh, uh, through history has, uh, has spent a little time on, on, uh, on doing strings. This is a plastic cast that um, Van Gogh has been um, manipulating a little bit. This base should be at the back of the sculpture here, but it's in the front and it has a phallic shape. So it's a kind of indecent version of plastic cast. And of course, we have these, um, the Futurist uh, Manifesto saying that um, in one and the same paragraph, it says that um, we have to get rid of, uh, we have to declare war on museums, on libraries, on feminism. And uh, it's all in the same paragraph, right? So it's the same thing to them to, to kind of get all these the old things, the museum, get it out, get it destroyed. So, and, and uh, since cast collections are made up of, uh, of casts uh, from, mainly from antiquity, and it takes uh, a lot of uh, scholarly uh, uh, knowledge to, 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 to know which, uh, which sculpture is, is what, which all this, there is an immense, um, weight of things you have to know to get the maximum um, uh, from, from uh, visiting such a cast collection. And of course, modernity hated all this tradition and things like that. And then in comes people who really loved antiquity, like the Nazis. Um, this is a cast of, uh, of the discus thrower that appears in Lady Wittgenstein's uh, film Olympia and, and uh, about uh, the Olympics uh, in Berlin. And here uh, a naked um, young man is, is standing in the same position. Um, Hitler was so fond of these cast collections uh, because uh, casts are hollow. You can easily put them on your back. And so he used them for his, these nightly processions with uh, torches and things. They would carry plaster casts of important figures to show people what was good taste, you know this, and all this in, uh, difference between good art and, uh, and art to the art. They would use the plaster cast to show people in the streets what was good art, like they would carry those plaster casts in the processions. And also uh, Hitler wanted the discus thrower from Rome and bought it from Mussolini, who delayed the transport so it could only come to Berlin just after the Olympics, just our <laughs> claim here. Uh, but it was in Berlin during the Second World War and returned after uh, the end of the Second World War. So um, this kind of knowledge about what's, what casts have, have been used to and, and what kind of thoughts that come into it, like. Arianism, the superior of, of the white man, all these things put shadows on these collections, deep shadows um, that are uh, interesting to, to, to acknowledge and, and try to handle. The final blow, the death blow to cast collections was, um, was uh, given by Clement Greenberg who had this idea that, uh, of specificity. Like the, the artwork has to refer to the material that it's actually made of. Like painting has to show off that it is painting. 
casts are not showing off the original material, which could be bronze or marble. Uh, also, it's full of this the, uh, awful thing to, to him, Alexandrianism, all this tradition. Everything, everything is wrong with, uh, with uh, plaster casts. We would say today that, uh, oh, it's only copies. Who cares about copies? Everybody wants to mirror themselves in original art, in contemporary art, because they want to be part of the contemporary. They want to be part of the new, the original, the special. So suddenly, uh, in modernist thinking, the cast collection was the last thing you wanted. And when the cast collection was put up, it was necessary. But suddenly it becomes the unwanted, the thing that performs really the wrong thing, the bad thing. Uh, and we will say that it completely misfires. It doesn't, it doesn't need, reach its audience anymore. Nobody wants it. Nobody cares. And we can see that from the 1930s on, um, cast collections, remaining cast collections, would close down. Um, and so it has been, uh, since all through the uh, 20th century, it has been closing, 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 neglecting, neglecting, neglecting these cast collections. So the conferences I go to, they all, they're called like, uh, destroy the copy number two, destroy the copy number three, things like that. But it's because of modernism. And you can say, okay, that's far away. But it's still, it is today still, the um, way that museums think about themselves is the same paradigm that they're working to. They haven't got into postmodernism yet. Well, they try by supplementing with contemporary artists to get into postmodernism. Now, the cast collection was moved away from the uh, National Gallery in 1966, taken to an old barn where it rained through the roof. Since it is the possession of the nation state, you cannot destroy it by purpose. But if it rains on it for a long enough time, it would kind of disappear by itself. So uh, they took it into this old barn, and it started to disappear. But in 1984, some artists, some archaeologists, and some art historians found the collection in the barn and considered it possible to save it before complete uh, ruin. Uh, and uh, they asked for a whatever place. Give us some place where we can put it into. And it was decided that it was to be put into the West Indian warehouse. Now that is a kind of coincidence. You have white man's white favorite art in white plaster moving into the West Indian warehouse, where all the goods from the West Indies produced by slavery once were stored. But it, did, it wasn't that, that wasn't the story at, the, at that time. It was just a matter of getting the plastic casts into the house. This is the, uh, the building, 1783. At the top of the building up here is the king's chamber, <coughs> where the king could meet with his uh, ministers who were also in charge of the trade on the West Indian islands and slavery and all that. So it is possible that the fate of slaves, perhaps the liberation of them, could have been discussed in that room. That would be an appropriate place to have that kind of discussion. So we have this room, uh, but nobody uh, can get access to it. Denmark is the only museum with a past related to slavery, which has no monument and no museum that tells the story. Uh, but this could be one place where you could tell the story. <coughs> well, after the moving into this warehouse, uh, a staff of people spent 19 years cleaning, restoring, and putting up for display this collection, and then they were fired because of financial cutbacks. And again, nobody really cared about the collection. It closed down. 
Um, then in 2010, um, we started to think about having uh, staff there again. And uh, by some coincidence, I, I, I just said that, OK, I can take over. I, I think I can make something funny out of that. Uh, and I was allowed to take over in, in 2010. And in 2014, I was formally uh, called the uh, senior curator of the uh, collection and, and the first uh, employee since 2002. But now they closed it down again uh, because of financial cutbacks. The same story, again and again. Uh, but when this collection was on my hands, <laughs> Um, I uh, was thinking of reliving it, like any other museum thinks about how can we relive this collection, this old thing, by uh, addressing hot topics, by using uh, this book in particular. In the Simon had just written a book uh, called The Participatory Museum. Um, and I read the book, I talked to, to Nina. She was uh, at the museum at the time, uh, at the National Gallery. Uh, and um, why did it do that? Uh, oh. um, and she put up some challenges in that book, the challenges that are relevant to every museum or cultural institution. It was a survey that they concluded on. And, uh, oh, sorry, something is going on here. I don't know why it's doing that. We better stop this. Time elapsed. Um, they ask people, what about, what do you think about cultural institutions? They think, people think they're irrelevant. They never change. They don't include my view. It's not a creative place. It's not a comfortable social place for me to be in and to talk with my friends and with strangers. So these are the challenges and the response uh, to all this is to make a museum participatory, which means inviting all those people who say, no, I don't care, invite them in to have their say on what should be going on. Now that is very, very tough to have that thing actually happening in museums. But I launched uh, different projects. Uh, that had this attitude, we invited uh, all kinds of students from all kind areas of, of uh, study to come to the collection. And then we said to them, it's yours. Do what you want with it, <clears throat> all right? I will leave you for a while and come back and hear what you think you want to do with it. So we did. Oh, now it's doing that again. Uh, these, this, this image is, uh, a large group of uh, students in contemporary dance who came to the collection. Oh, sorry. It's on the slideshow. Yeah, I don't know how it got there. <laughs> we'll keep it there if you can. Um, I cannot speak that fast. <laughs> the contemporary dances, to have them into that kind of collection is a kind of tricky, tricky thing. Contemporary dance is made as a kind of negative reaction to classical ballet. So have them invited into a collection of classical art is like inviting them, in, inviting them into all the things they hate. And one of the, uh, what do you call them, those, um, one of the, um, the instructors they had, uh, he went to the collection, he said, I can't do this. This is too much. This is tradition, it's all I hate, I have to. I have to cancel my part of the agreement. So he was out of the project, but the students, they loved it. There is a little story to contemporary uh, dance. It is in their mind, they are dancing the original Dionysic antique way of dancing, not the Apollonian. So they have a connection back to antiquity if they know their story. Uh, so these Students in contemporary dance, they took up the challenge. They borrowed 10 casts that we took out to their 
uh, to the area where they practice. Um, and they rehearsed and made a performance. You can see one of the casts in the back there, Venus de Milo. Um, and then, then, it came, then it kind of exploded, because this was a big project. It had government funding. Now, this is important. The, in the very second you get government funding into a museum, everybody wants to support you. Before that, nobody really cares. You know that. But in the second you get public funding, everybody turns your way. So suddenly the museum had to take serious this kind of participatory practice. What is this thing going on? Uh, I talked to my colleagues say, uh, and I said, from now on, this will be how I will be working with all my projects. And they, of course, said, you must be completely out of your mind because the curator is losing power. We don't know what's going to happen. These are not professionals. This is damaging to our profession. All these kinds of negative uh, responses, they were there, but also was the money. So that, silence, that silences everything. As far as you've got the money, then you can do whatever you want. So I started. Uh, these are dances. Here comes a new a completely brand new uh, direction, uh, a, a kind of new study at the university uh, called lighting design. Because you have to have young people who can design uh, light for stages, for concerts, for all, oh sorry, she's doing that again. Um, so these are lighting design students putting color light, playing a little Andy Warhol on uh, one of the casts. This, I think, is, this is not nice high art. It's just students playing something. And they are actually doing it not for fun because they had to graduate from uh, doing these projects, so it's serious for them. But um, it's, it just opened the door to a lot of projects which are not all high art. This is a project, this is, this is not high art. This is just jewelry, you know? Contemporary jewelry, and you will. Uh, we had a, a request from a school that would have their graduate exhibit uh, if it could be in the cast collection. And why not put jewelry on these, oh, shit, on these uh, statues? So we did. But now we are far away and into trouble because is this not an art museum, right? What is this? This is. This is not art. This is. Oh, it's yeah. Craftsmanship, things like that. A lot of trouble into that. And what about assurance? What if anything is stolen? Things like that will be a big problem. Uh, but we, well, we, we tried it and it worked out fine. And we had the most wonderful, crazy exhibit uh, of uh, jewelry on statues. It worked out fine. Um, one thing didn't work out fine. Uh, this little thing about having white man's white cast in the warehouse where goods came from the West Indies. That's a nice story to us. But to some people, it's not. It's kind of a real living trauma. One of those who made items for this exhibit, uh, she had the uh, privilege of having her jewelry on the poster. It was selected to be, well, good for the poster. So it was on the poster, but when she heard what kind of house she was displaying in, she took away her, her items and went away and said she would never return. So now we have a situation where the jewelry that is on the poster is not in the exhibit. Not good. Uh, not a good situation for a normal museum to have that kind of thing going on. But it was kind of so traumatic to her that she refused to, uh, to, to put anything on display there. She was of West Indian descent. And after a couple of days, she returned, saying, I melted down the uh, jewelry, but I created some new things, and I wanted to be part of the collection. So she offered it as a gift, a little like uh, the wing <laughs> for the tape. 
she had melted down her jewelry and turned them into rings, silver rings with uh, different kinds of stones uh, and sugar as the uh, at the front of the at the top of the rings as decoration. Brown sugar, sugar, which relates to one of the major uh, goods that was uh, produced in the West Indians, namely sugar from sugar cane. Uh, which also had a very, another very important uh, byproduct, namely rum. So now we got into difficult uh, waters. Now we had, now, now I started to understand, to, to kind of get a little idea of what could happen in this house, right? We could have things going on that were really difficult. It was a, a, a good area to invite people in and have difficult matters discussed or displayed or referred to. Sorry about this. Thing. Well, Ayla's here. She decided to do a performance in there where she selected the position of this canvas in front of a goddess of revenge. And she's taking revenge um, by hitting a white canvas with, with a whip. Uh, where you have uh, charcoal added to it, so it leaves a trace on the uh, on the uh, on the canvas. And I was, I think this this is exactly this is exactly the kind of intervention that I really want. Uh, I really love this piece, and I asked uh, for it to be brought to the museum, and it was rejected because I am not allowed to. Uh, to make pre uh, prepositions on contemporary art because I'm into antiquity, right? So don't interfere into contemporary art. Um, so it was rejected. Um, and since then, this, this particular performance uh, has won many international prizes. So I, 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 I still regret that, I, that we couldn't uh, acquire it for the National Gallery. I think it would be have been a wonderful piece, but that's how it is. The worst thing you, you can imagine as uh, a curator of a cast collection is that there is a student from the academy coming to you saying, I want to destroy a plastic cast. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing you want. But of course, that's the first thing I want. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy when, oh, you were in, when a student came by saying, I want if I can borrow a plastic cast and smash it in front of a large audience, that would be nice. <laughs> and of course, I, th I thought that would be very nice. That's just exactly what we need, because everybody hates the cast collection. Nobody <laughs> wants to take care of it. Why not smash it? They have been doing it all the time. So she was actually not doing something special. She was doing what everybody has been doing for, uh, for decades. So we made a plastic cast for her. We can just make another one, you know? It's just cartoons. And she put it on a scaffold and threw it out from the scaffold and smashed in front of people saying, no, 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 don't do it. I love that. When they said, don't do it, because really, they don't care at all. Uh, but in that particular moment, they thought it was a little too much. But the real idea about this was that she wanted to collect all the debris, all of it, and, and um, melt it into powder again and burn it so that it could be used for another sculpture. So this is spear bearer number one, and this is the same spear bearer number two. The same plaster reused in a completely different sculpture, placed in the cast collection. Well, one of the last things I will show you is another intervention into into the cast collection. It is a, a tent-shaped thing. Uh, and that relates also to this strange story of white man's white favorite art, colonialism, oh, there we go again. And all that. Um, this artist has been traveling in Africa. She has been uh, reading a lot of books about how white man explores the foreigners, and again and again, the same image turned up of these white explorers with their tents. We saw one 
a tent. This strange picture we saw in another presentation where the tent was inside a room, but he needed the tent. Uh, but this is a tent-shaped thing occurring on the floor of the cast collection. Uh, I think this is a, a very wonderful piece because it's, it's so odd uh, in comparison to all those figurative elements in the collection. So suddenly the abstract and the figurative seems to collide or circulate around each other. Something strange happens here that I'm really fond of. And she also put up, uh, she intervened into the library. Ooh, very tricky thing. Everything is so well ordered in the library. But she intervened making a whiteness archive, putting up uh, uh, white sheets of paper, copy paper, it's all about copies, uh, copies of text that relates to whiteness in all its different uh, shapes and understandings. Um, and then the, the last thing I would like to do is to be a little bit theoretical about it all because um, what I'm doing is I'm adding supplements to a supplement and uh, of course I was thinking about Derrida in his grammatology who says that um, he has something, oh we have, he says a lot about what a supplement is and I think that when all these museums ask you to come there and supplement their old collections with contemporary art, it's the kind of thing it, it can be related to, to what uh, Derrida was talking about. Uh, the dangerous supplement is masturbation. Very dangerous. Derrida is reading Jean-Jacques Rousseau, another philosopher, uh, who in his confessions confesses to have started to masturbate more and more instead of doing the real thing. He knows it's wrong. He knows it's bad. He knows it all, but he cannot live without it. And it adds exactly what any supplement to a museum is. It accumulates presence. It supplies what is lacking in something that would be considered perfect or, and not in need of any supply, but it is. The problem is that this supplementary practice uh, could be seen as a manifestation of the deficiency of the institution where the supplement is added to, because is it filling a kind of gap? Is it an addition that is needed? Why is it needed to go into any collection? Isn't it perfect enough in itself? That's what it is. But the really dangerous thing about the supplement is in this text and in this context is that the supplement might take over completely. And that is what happens to, to, uh, to Rousseau. And that is what might happen to museums when they start having these supplements coming in, these rubbings on the real thing, these, yeah masturbations going on in old collections. They might take over, take control. And that is why these supplementary exhibits are very short-lived in order to control that they don't take over. <laughs> they remain for only a very, very short period of time. But the idea that I had from reading this was that why not let the supplement take over the entire collection? So. If I have not been unfortunate to, to face uh, another shutdown of the collection, my idea was actually to allow for contemporary art to come into the collection on and on and on again, on kid, until it was completely changed. Well, but it should not be that way. The supplementary practice the participatory ideas, it has all come to an end now because the collection is now closed again and I had the idea that, okay, they don't really want it. They hated it anyway. 
So, but this morning, I want to add this. This morning on my phone, uh, I had a message from the National Gallery where two curators said that it has now been decided that the permanent collection should have interventions going on and on and on from now on from selected artists that they select, of course. It will not be dangerous, I tell you, at all. It won't be like, it won't really change anything. It will be like that masturbation on the old thing. Uh, but what do I know? Perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps supplements will take over control of the National Gallery. We'll have to see about that. Thank you. Henrik, I'm aware, again, of over time, and it's uh, been quite an intense sort of session, but we have plenty of time for um, discussion. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that we maybe take a question for Henrik, then we have our coffee, then we return for a discussion we take up um, from everybody who's um, presented it today. Um, so does Emily have something that you'd like to begin by asking Henry before we take the coffee break, or did I fuck that by saying let's have the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Go, Joe. I'm going to ask you. It's kind of um, why did they shut down the cats to museum? Oh, the official reason is the just... The official and then I want to know the truth. I, can, I yeah. cannot tell you the truth because I will be the last one in the world to know the truth about this. But it was just said that uh, the official reason is that there are financial cutbacks and they had to do a kind of selection. So Was anything else close? Uh A lot of staff members were uh, sacked also, so other departments suffered, I would say, but uh, this is a very kind of obvious visual thing to have a thing disappearing like that. That will not happen to other departments. They will lose uh, workforce and creativity and all that, but um, they didn't close down. And so do you think that um, the real reason uh, had to do with the, um, you know, the way in which you were really decidedly critiquing the history of the cast collection? I mean, they were, these were really political works, weren't they? I, can't, I cannot say. I can only say that I have a personal feeling that I was becoming a nuisance to them in every way. Mm -hmm. Because I started to work with contemporary art, which is not my domain. I ta started to th talking about a museum becoming participatory. We, I, I didn't mean the cast collection becoming participatory. I meant the National Gallery to turn it over to the nation, right? to the public, to do things like that. And as I, as I said, uh, they thought I was really crazy there. Uh, that would be a disaster for them. Um, and um, I felt a kind of coldness. But it might be just me. I don't know. And as I said, I would be the last person in the world to know actually why. Uh, they so won't tell me. One more question related to this, Jason. Is that Go on up. So they're going to, they've now decided to basically take on your idea right and have contemporary art interventions in the museum that's right so so thank you <laughs> no thanks it's their idea I'm, I'm they don't credit me for it no of course not it's, not it's, it's, it's something it's new that they came up with all by themselves yes of course they did um, and ideas are free so perhaps they did um and uh, are they going to hire a curator just out of curiosity are they going to hire a contemporary art curator oh they have several so they'll just oh, keep okay. on with those they have. Oh, okay. So they will then start doing these? Yeah. Curating. Okay. 